this is going to be really cool. And I hope you all enjoy it. When you're done, we ask you as a favor to us. It helps us with our programming if you let us know what you think of this and if you have any ideas for any other things you'd like to hear about. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, it's a, a little bit about me. Since this is a Veterans Day program, it's probably a good thing that I'm a veteran. I spent 1966 in Southeast Asia. Um, I moved, I'm not a Seymour native, though. Like, I get a lot of this, uh, you ain't from around here, are you? Because I don't know a lot of the history of the town, and that's why I appreciate it when Charlotte and some other people do history programs here. I get to learn about them. Uh, we have Jan Sipes and Dick Brumfer here from the Jackson County History Center. Um, and, and Charlotte. And Charlotte, of course. Uh, and so they're doing, going a long way to help keep us all informed about the history of our area. Uh, my, um, I guess, area of expertise is really narrow. Uh, I know about the museum here, and that's about it. So let's see here. Uh, with respect to the museum, I first got involved with it in 2001 and got on the board in 2002. I was president for a while. And then in order to give me some status so I could scrounge things up, they appointed me to be the curator so I could put it on my business card. See? So that, that and 40 cents used to get coffee at McDonald's. Anyway. Uh, what I'd like to talk about tonight uh, is to talk a little bit about the history of Freeman Field, how it came into being and what happened during the war and after the war. Uh, talk a little bit about how we actually operate the museum. And this would be a good time to point out the two other people are here. I have shells too. Mike, Mike Jordan is here. He's on our board. And Marty Schwab. Um, uh, they have both help us run the museum. Uh, Marty builds things. So you come out to the museum and you see uh, large display stands and so forth, and chances are Marty built them. Uh, Mike is big on framed pictures. A lot of the framed artwork and memorabilia is compliments of Mike. So thank you both for coming out and lending moral support this evening. Um, anyway, after we talk a little bit about how the museum operates. Then I have some slides to show you some of the major exhibits that are in the museum, kind of a virtual tour. And then that's pretty much that. And we'll have time, I'm sure, for some questions and answers. So I might ask if you have a cell phone, please put it on vibrate or silent or something. I just stood over there against the wall and did mine. Occasionally I forget, and then mine rings. Boy, is that embarrassing. OK, so do a little bit of history here. When right after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and you know, even before that, it was pretty obvious to a lot of people we were going to get sucked into this war. And then the Japanese made a point of it. And so really fast, we needed to train a whole lot of bomber and transport pilots, pilots that flew big airplanes. Now, we also needed fighter pilots, but the Freeman Army Airfield didn't have anything to do with them, so we focused on the bomber guys. So Paul Press ran around here in early 1942 with a couple other officers, and they ran around in the Midwest trying to find sites to, to put uh, air bases to train pilots. And they went and looked in different places, and they ended up selecting Seymour of all places. Why in the world would they select Seymour? Because Paul Preuss was from Seymour, that's why. So he just, after he ran around and went through the motion, said, oh yeah, we'll put it in Seymour. So, but after that, it wasn't very popular here because the military condemned I get to get the right number, 27 farms totaling 2,600 acres. And they went in and paid the owners what was then 
fair market value for their land and for their buildings and so forth, and gave them 30 days to pack up and get out. I want to tell you, they weren't very happy. But there was a war on, and they did that. So we spent then nine months building a military base, soup to nuts. Now, considering that these days it takes 10 years to build a runway, like at Chicago O'Hare, the first seven years they fight about the environmental impact. But in 1942, they didn't worry about snail darters or spotted owls or anything else. They just built a base. They came in here, and of the 27 farms, they just leveled them all except three. They kept three of the houses, one of which is still standing, the casting house. They kept them for officers. The rest of it, they just knocked down the barns, the houses, the outbuildings, the outhouse, everything else. They just flattened it and built a base. It was activated. It was wasn't quite complete yet. It wasn't my, in December of 42, but it was activated December of 42. They had some finish-up work to do in early 43. Um, they built 413 buildings. There's only 11 of them remaining today. Our museum is in two of them, and the others are scattered around on the field. Uh, all the rest are gone. Keep in mind, these were temporary buildings. They were wood frame. In fact, the, the building numbers said uh, they were all assigned T numbers, you know, T110, T232, and the T, I believe, was for temporary. The deal was, it only had to last five years. You know, either we were going to win the war and we wouldn't need the base anymore, or we were going to lose the war and we wouldn't need the base anymore. So these buildings were just thrown up as quickly as they could so they could begin training pilots. Um, in order to do this pilot training, we had 250 AT-10 airplanes here. These airplanes were built only for the Army Air Corps, only for the purpose of training multi-engine pilots. Uh, There's no civilian designation for them, and they were very austere inside. They only had a couple of seats. Uh, and when the war was over, they essentially scrapped them. There were actually 2,400 built. We were not the only base that had these airplanes, but there were 250 of them based here. Um, besides Freeman Field, the training pilots flew out of five other airfields, one called St. Anne's, which is now the North Vernon Airport. Uh, there's an airport in Walesboro, which is now closed, but the runways are still there. Uh, they do like tractor, trailer, driver training and testing on it, I think, or at least they used to. There's one called Grammar. Um, Grammar was what, up to the northwest, I think. Millport, I know where Millport is, or it was shown to me. I don't know if I could pick it out again because it's back in uh, farmland again. And Zenus, same way, it's back in farmland. So if you fly around, hunt for the ones that weren't paved to start with, they're really hard to find. We trained in essentially two years. The thing was open right at the end of 42. We did training in 1943 and 1944. By early 1945, they didn't really need any more bomber pilots, so they stopped training. There was only one class in 1945. But at any rate, in 19 classes, we trained 4,225 cadets to fly those twin-engine AT-10 airplanes. Now, you need to know that the pilots that came here already knew how to fly. They had been through basic aircraft training and knew how to fly single engine airplanes. So they came here for nine weeks of training and they learned to fly 
airplanes with more than one engine and they also learned instrument flight, how to control the airplane by looking only at the instruments in the panel, not looking outside. So they could fly bombers through cloud layers and in bad weather, a necessary skill. After they left here, then they went to their third and final level of training, which was to learn to fly the really big airplanes. Um, and that was type-specific training. If you went to B-17 school, learned to fly B-17 bombers, that's what you flew in the war. There wasn't much crossover because the really big airplanes aren't very similar from one model to another. Oh, what else is on this slide here? Okay. Um, graduation from the program here at Seymour was a big deal. When they came here, they were still called cadets. They didn't have any real rank. It was upon graduation from advanced training here at Seymour that they became commissioned officers in the U.S. Army Air Corps. And so not only did they start getting some respect, they also got a pretty big raise in pay. So it was a big deal to finish the training here. Uh, there were graduation programs printed for each graduating class. It was kind of like a high school graduation thing. Um, so we at the museum, if you come out, we have 18, I'll get the word out, 18 of the original graduation programs. We have one that's missing. We keep hoping someday somebody will walk in and say, oh, I've got that at home. But nobody's done that yet. Um, there were roughly 5,000 permanent military people here engaged in operating the base. Um, and when Mike gives tours, he points out that the population of Seymour essentially doubled in a year. So it was like a huge change for the town of Seymour to have this big military base come in like overnight. Uh, it's hard to imagine what it must have been like. Uh, you know, we have a lot of pictures out of the museum, but being here must have been something. Um, we'll talk more about this at the end, but just to keep the timeline going here, after the war was essentially over, they started sending captured enemy airplanes here. And after the training function stopped in Seymour, they didn't close the base. They repurposed it. It became the Foreign Aircraft Evaluation Center. And we had 160 captured enemy airplanes here. So in 1946, you could see airplanes flying over Seymour that had swastikas and rising suns on them. Must have been pretty unique to see them flying around here. Uh, the, that activity lasted for about a year, 15 months. The uh, technicians that were evaluating the airplanes learned what they wanted to learn or expected to learn by that time. And then the base was closed. It was sold to the city for a dollar with a caveat that if war broke out again, the uh, army could take it over again. So the city in turn turned it into the industrial park that we see out there today. So what we are really today is an industrial park with a couple of runways. Okay, so that's, that's a brief history of the field. and talk a, a little bit about the history of the museum, how it got it started, and how we run it. Um, in 1995, there were discussions uh, about opening a museum. And at the December Airport Authority meeting that year, the airport board decided that we ought to have a museum. At that time, Ted Jordan was the airport manager, and they directed him to begin doing what it took to open a museum. There was an empty building right there, our original building that we still have today. And so Ted recruited some board members, including local people, Jack Hildreth, Harry Knight, Al Seibert, some others, to be on the original board. And they started collecting up memorabilia. And it took a while to do this. The museum really didn't open until the summer of 1997, but 
We have researched, I've researched, I cannot find the official date that the museum opened. Uh, I went through all the issues of the tribute compliments of the library, they're on microfilm upstairs. Um, literally looked at each one on microfilm, can't find a thing in the paper that said Freeman Army Airfield Museum opens to the public or something. So if any of you clearly are here because you're interested in history, I'd sure like to know the official date. At any rate, uh, shortly, I guess actually even a year or two before the museum opened, we started having reunions here for the cadets that trained at Freeman Field. Now keep in mind, back in the early 90s, these were still relatively young men. Some of, many of them still flew. They flew their own planes in for reunions. And we had reunions for the cadets every two years. And the work got around and the reunions got bigger. And, and of course, whenever there was a reunion, one of the activities was they would go through the museum. And originally, the museum was only a couple of rooms without too much memorabilia. But the cadets were generous, and they go, oh, I've got some stuff you ought to have. When I get home, I'll send it to you. Or when I come back in two more years, I'll bring that with me. So we got a lot of stuff that's in the museum, especially early on, from the cadets who actually trained here. Um, then, as the word got out, that people in town would give his stuff. You know, somebody that served in the war, man, Uncle Charlie would pass away, and they'd be cleaning out the attic and find things, and they'd call up Ted or Al Cyber or something, and they'd go get the stuff. So that's how we got a lot of things. Our museum doesn't buy things on the open market. I know of only one display item that we bought, and Mayor Burkhart bought it for us, Mike. The, the uh, leather uniform? We took it out of the Mayor Promotional Fund. Right. It was for sale over in Bloomington, and they really are rare. And. Uh, might prevail upon some people to help us out because the museum typically has no money. So that's the only item I know that we've actually gone out and purchased. Um, so as I said, we have no ongoing source of funds. The way we keep the doors open is, thankfully, the airport authority pays our utility bills and they do the maintenance on the outside of the building. Buildings, we have two now. Um, the um, interior of the building is up to us and any changes that we make or build things or displays, whatever, we have to raise the money to do that. But the airport authority takes care of some of those basics. Um, we get occasionally apply for grants like the community foundation or uh, Brain Cramp, Jackson County, can't think of the other name of the other fund. Anyway, um, so occasionally we get a grant if we have a worthy project. Uh, <coughs> local businesses have been really good to us, by the way. People will do things for us for free. They give us, they'll do work for us or give us materials or something so that we can get things done. And then when people come tour the museum, there's no charge to get in the museum. It's free. And parking is free. Everything's free. But we do have, like most museums, a donation container. And thankfully, people from time to time put some money in there and that helps out. Uh, not on the slide. Um, the directors here, we often just go out and buy stuff the museum needs out of our pockets. So to some degree, being a director is an excuse to spend money on the museum. Uh, lately, we have done some fundraising activities, though. This year, for the first time, we hosted an airplane ride day, and we got local pilots to donate their airplane time and their time to fly them. And then we asked for donations of $20 a person. And we actually raised a couple thousand dollars in a day doing that. So that we intend to do that again. That was pretty successful. Uh, 
We were recently given a boat um, that we're fixing up. Marty's already started on it that we hope to fix up over the winter and sell in the spring to raise a little money. And also in the past year, we started up a small sales area. You know, some museums have a big room. On the way out, you walk through this room and they try to sell you all this stuff. Well, we just happen to have a little area about eight feet wide where we have a few things that we sell, uh, DVDs and pictures and things uh, about the museum, coffee mugs, and so forth. There's a picture of the boat. Marty's working on it. Um, the museum is all volunteer. Nobody has anything to do with the museum gets paid ever. If one of us buys something big and the museum can afford it, yes, they get paid back. But nobody gets paid for their time. There are nine directors, and occasionally past directors will come out and help us out if we're doing some big activity. Uh, right now we're open every Saturday morning from 10 until 1, uh, and otherwise we open by appointment. Whenever anybody asks us, we'll take one or two people through, or a whole busload of people, pretty much whenever they want. As long as we have a little bit of notice, one of us can usually get over there and do a tour. Uh, we really, really want to be open four days a week. We'd like to be open Wednesday through Saturday, 10 to 2. But that takes more volunteers than we have we, we have two buildings, so to have both buildings open, you have to have two people there. And since no one wants to live out there as a volunteer, everybody has another life, right? So, um, but we're developing a list, slowly but surely, and one of these days we're going to get to the point where we have critical mass, and we're going to go to four days a week. Um, and I said, we like to do group tours, especially uh, school groups come out, and assisted living facilities uh, bring these uh, minibus loads of folks over to do tours. They really seem to enjoy it because they're generally older folks, and a lot of them remember the things that are in the museum. So we, we find that very gratifying to do those tours. So there's our little six foot wide sales area not too impressive but we have a few things um, and that's it so that's how we run the museum um, so here i can show you some slides of things that are in the museum this is by no means a uh, this isn't all the stuff is what i'm trying to say so we had a new sign we got a grant for the sign a new sign put up this year and the airport authority put new roofs on both of our buildings. So that's the building with a new sign and the new roof. Um, the entry room where you enter the place, that's where we have most of the personal items that the cadets were kind enough to give us when they were here for um, reunions. We have a diorama. We keep moving this diorama. Al Seibert built it. And originally, it was completely horizontal, flat, like tabletop. But what happened was kids couldn't see it. They weren't tall enough. It was up too high. And folks on wheelchairs, like the assisted living folks that come, they couldn't see it either. So the next thing we did was we inclined it. So the thing's eight feet by eight feet, so it's pretty big. So we inclined it about 30 degrees. Then kids and wheelchair people could see it but it still took up an enormous amount of space. So just this year, we finally stood the thing up. So now you're seeing it stood up. The um, uniform is for a guy named Bill Janke, one of the cadets, and we rigged it up so he holds the pointer in his hand. We're trying to train Bill to explain the, the base operations to people, but we haven't quite gotten there yet. But that's the way it is now anyway. Uh, here's a model of the airplanes, the AT-10s. There's only one AT-10 left in the world. It's up at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. And it's actually a little hard to see. They have it on display, but it's behind some other stuff, and it's hard to photograph. Um, there is a guy who has bits and pieces of several of them, 
and I, I just learned this earlier this year, he intends to take all his bits and pieces and build a whole bunch more and actually build one up and make it fly. His budget to do this is they can do it in two years because he's hired a professional aircraft restoration company and they're going to pour $700,000 on it to get it done. And he promises me he'll bring it to Seymour when he gets it flying. Now, you may know the name. The guy's name is Sam Graves, United States House of Representatives, 5th District, Missouri, and he's the chairman of the House General Aviation Caucus. So he's a semi-famous guy, and I spent almost an hour with him at Oshkosh at the big fly-in this summer uh, talking about this. And anyway, he swears he's going to bring the airplane here. So we're going to like break out the brass band when he, when he shows up with it. That's the only parts of AT-10s that we have are on that table. We have a real windshield out of one and then some other bits and pieces, landing gear, a few other things, and that's it. Uh, what went on with these things is they were, let me go, they were built out of wood because aluminum metals were being used for fighters and bombers in the war. They didn't have any extra metal. There was rationing going on. So they built these things, had wooden wings. The wings had, the wings in a fuselage had plywood on the outside. The frame was metal, and obviously the engines were metal, and the landing gear was metal, but the rest of them, they were essentially wood. And after the war was over, they had no civilian purpose. The government sold them for $50 a piece. Farmers bought them for the fuel that was in the wings. And once they took the fuel out, they chopped the wings off and burnt them for firewood. They left the fuselage intact and made them into sheds, chicken coops, you know, until they rotted away and then they just throw them out. And that's why there's none left. Okay, we have uh, quite a few uniforms that people have been kind enough to give us over the years. And in recent times, we, we got a grant from the Community Foundation to get a number of mannequins to properly display the uniforms. We used to just have them on hangers. Those of you who might have been out in the museum in the past saw a lot of uniforms on hangers. There's still a couple on hangers, but mostly now we have them decently displayed and we're really happy with that because they just don't seem to mean much on hangers. Uh, oh, the in this slide, on the right, the leather outfit with, that's uh, like fur trim, that was the item that we bought from the military surplus place the mayor bought for us over in uh, Flemington. We have a bunch of, we have a bunch of pillow covers that were common during World War II and I think in the Korean War as well. It was common for each military base to have these embroidered pillow covers, no pillow in them, just a cover. And uh, a military person would buy one, put it in an envelope, send it home, and then their wife or girlfriend or uh, mother, whatever, would put a pillow in it and then put it on the front room, put it on, put it on a, a uh, couch on the front room in memory of their loved one that was off serving in the war. We had one or two framed ones and a bunch of other ones in storage. And as part of the museum reorganization that we did over a three-year period, we had them all framed and grouped them all in one place. So that's what that's all about. Um, I already mentioned that the cadets went on to fly big bombers after they left Freeman Field. This room has models of the types of bombers they went on to fly. And I mentioned that we had the graduation programs from each uh, class. 
the yellow and then lay further down they turn white documents on the high shelf is our collection of those programs. The Tuskegee Airmen, the black airmen group that are mostly noted for flying fighters. They had they flew P-51s with red tails and they escorted bombers during the war. They're pretty famous for that. There's a movie called Red Tails. But there was also a group later in the war they decided they would train up a unit of bomber pilots. But it wasn't very popular and a lot of people thought that black folks weren't able to actually do something as precise as bombing. And these people got shoved all over the place from one base to another. Nobody wanted them. And one of the places they got sent to was Freeman Field. And they were only here for a couple months in 1945. The war was actually starting to wind down. Uh, a group, these were officers now, a group of officers decided that they would integrate the white officers club on the field. Now they had their own black officers club, but it was substandard relative to the white officers club. And in theory, the services were desegregated, but in practice, they were not. And so they went down there and decided they'd have a drink. There was some pushing and shoving. Uh, nobody really got hurt, but a bunch of them got arrested. They soon let most of them go, but kept three that they court-martialed. Two were found not guilty, and one poor fellow became the fall guy and was found guilty. He was later, some years later, exonerated. Uh, but. It wasn't a proud period in the history of Freeman Field, but if you can find any silver lining in that, it was one of the events that was a catalyst to actually end segregation in the armed services. Along about 1947, the president said, enough's enough, we're done with this. But this was one of the things leading up to that. So anyway, since they were there, we have, uh, two walls in one room where we honor the Tuskegee Airmen. And out in the front at our entrance, there is a granite plaque that also honors the fact that they were at Freeman Field. The other group, and this is in the same room on the other side, the other group that were kind of a minority were the women that served in the war. Now, Back then, women couldn't serve in combat, right? They can now, but not then. But that doesn't mean that they didn't fly airplanes or they didn't do a whole lot of other hard work, including working in factories to build the airplanes and the trucks and the tanks and so forth that the men could use in the war. Um, and there were a lot of nurses. This is a gray lady uniform. They were actually volunteers. Uh, and actually not medically trained. They helped with administrative issues and uh, morale building and so forth. The, the, uh, that's an uh, authentic officer's uniform that my wife bought off eBay and donated to the museum. We had wanted for years to get a, a true nurse's uniform, couldn't find one, and this came up on eBay and Pat bought it. So that's how we got that. So I guess that's a bought item, but it was donated to the museum. Um, because the women were sort of unsung heroes, nobody paid much attention to them, it's really hard to get memorabilia, uh, uh, actual tangible things that, that the women worked with. So we have a few things in a glass case. We sure like to get more women's stuff from that era, but it's not very forthcoming. We have a lot of pictures from the women's area, but not actual items. I mentioned that after the war, the, ba the base became the Foreign Aircraft Evaluation Center, and the picture on the left is the, is the actual sign that was out at Wal the Walnut Street entrance. The picture on the right is a replica that a friend of the museum made for us. We thought about putting it out in front of the museum, but first of all, 
it's like 12 feet high, and we were concerned that with the wind we have out at the airfield, it's pretty open, so the wind really blows out there, that it might blow over, and we also had concerns about graffiti, so in the end, we just keep it inside. I said that uh, we had all these captured enemy airplanes there, so we have models of them because after the evaluation period was over, those enemy airplanes were sent, uh, a lot of them, up to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where the uh, Air Force Museum is today, and to other museums around the country. That took care of the whole airplanes, but many of them they disassembled. They took them completely apart, trying to find out the technology that went into them, the metallurgy, how the engines worked, radios, armament. They just took them apart. Well, when they got all finished and they closed the base and the whole airplanes went to museums, it's like, what do we do with this stuff? Oh, I don't know, let's jump. Get that junk out of here. We're closing. Ah, uh -huh. I don't want to do that. Break. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, there were a whole lot of aircraft parts. And what they did was they just used like bobcats, front end loaders, dump, put them in dump trucks, took them out on the field, used bulldozers to big, dig big trenches, threw them in, and buried, and just buried them. So it was, they were done, and they left, and it became an industrial park. Nobody cared about it till the 90s. And then people said, but there's a bunch of stuff buried out here somewhere. And they also thought that there might be 14 whole airplanes buried out there because there were 14 that they couldn't account for where they went. So um, I won't bore you all night, but over time there have been three groups of people have dug for things out there. There was a group in the early 90s called Blue Sky, and that's what they got, Blue Sky. They got skunked, they didn't find anything. Uh, a group in the late 90s, 97, 98, um, wasn't finding anything either, and it was really hot. And one day, because it was so hot in the afternoon, they decided to go under this big tree and dig there, because it was shady. And by dumb luck, they started finding things. So they found a bunch of stuff, and we have a lot of that in the museum now. Um, there was a third group that dug from 2008 till 2013. They didn't do a lot of digging, though. They did a whole lot of research, and among other things, they figured out where 11 of the 14 airplanes went. So then we were down to three, and the three are probably on the field. One was one that crashed in a terrible wreck and the pilot was killed. And finding it would be just to find some rolled up metal. It was really bad. So finding that airplane wouldn't be all that great. Uh, another one was a German bomber that local residents remember was out there years after the war. Kids played in it. And at some point it just disappeared. And nobody knows exactly why it disappeared or where it went. But, I, you know, it must have become an eyesore or somebody decided it was dangerous or something. They just hauled it off and it was gone. And the last one we think is buried under a concrete pad out there in one of the, where, in front of one of the warehouses on the flight line. And those folks don't think it would be a good idea if we dug it up. So that's it. So now, suddenly we figured out there aren't 14 airplanes buried out there just waiting for somebody to stumble upon. So now nobody's very excited about digging anymore. So anyway, there's nobody digging out there at the present time. We have a nice library and meeting room. And by the way, we do allow people or groups to come and use our meeting room to hold meetings there. Uh, Jan's group came. You came over once, right? Didn't you come over? We, mm -hmm. And we had a meeting at your facility as well later on. So 
we encourage that kind of thing because it gets the word out about the museum and then we can take people on a tour and we're happy to do that. Uh, here's some just real quick exhibits. We have a daily living exhibit. We have one of the uh, coal stoves that was actually in the barracks during World War II. Uh, some other uh, items that have to do just with daily life, not fighting. We're not a firearms museum, but uh, people have been kind enough to give us a few guns, so we do have them on display. Uh, this is one of our newest displays, and the base that this glass case is sitting on is one of the things that Marty built. Remember, said Marty builds things. So uh, it, having it sit on the floor, it was way too low, so Marty built that. And then we collected up all of our German aircraft armament. We have three machine guns and some sights and a Luger pistol and so forth. And we put them all in this case. Marty worked on the case as well. I did the lighting. And so pretty soon we think that's a pretty neat display. I do have over here on the table one of the machine guns out of that case I brought for you to look at tonight. So after the program's over if you want to come up and look at it. Yes, Mike, please. Uh, you might point out that those machine guns were dug up out there. They weren't given to us. We found them. Oh, right. That's true. All three machine guns were dug up on the field. Uh, there, there is a story behind the one I brought out here. Uh, I'll tell it at the end if we have time. Oh, uh, we have a big case full of instruments and radios from the World War II period. There were gliders here for a few months. At the end of the war, they didn't know what to do with the glider stuff. So they sent it here from Ohio. It was here for a little while. They sent it someplace else. They were just playing hopscotch with it. But since there were gliders here, we uh, have a small display honoring that. And that's a neat thing. We have the original wall map, covers a whole wall from base operations. Uh, they used this map for flight planning when the cadets would go on um, cross-country flights as part of their training. They would go several hundred miles. They had to figure out where they were going, how far it was, when they would have to stop for fuel, and so forth. So they used this big wall map to do that. When the airport authority decided to turn tear down the old base operations building quite a number of years ago, we said, hey, we want that map off the wall. And they said, well, come get it, because we're tearing the building down. Oh, we couldn't get the map off the wall. That hunt, The thing the map is on is the wall. We had to take that to the museum. But at any rate, it's still there. And in recent times, we put plastic over it to protect it and so forth. So we think that's pretty neat to have that. We have a bunch of dummy bombs. They're not real. But the kids love them. When kids come in the museum, they just run to that corner. I didn't know bombs were that popular with kids until they started running over there. But they do it every time. You, you can count on it. Uh, we have a big case full of safety stuff. May West life jackets, parachutes, respirators, all that kind of stuff from the war. Baseball was a big deal. Uh, from a morale thing, and we have a case of uh, baseball memorabilia there. We have publications. This is a new display uh, about, about a year ago. There was a newspaper published at Freeman Field uh, weekly. So the base was actually open for training purposes for about 100 weeks. There's 99 issues and they were all gathered in one bound volume and they had them over at the Tribune building. Now it came to pass that after Ted Jordan was airport manager, he worked over there for a while and during his employment there, he managed to obtain, <laughs> obtain that bound volume. So we have it in the museum now. <laughs> um, the other thing is, for the first couple of classes, remember I said they did things like high school graduations? They, 
they actually printed yearbooks, like a high school yearbook, but they only did it for the first two classes, and, the, and they did the first two classes in one yearbook. I, I don't know what stopped it, but my guess is somebody said, you know, these people are only here nine weeks. This is a heck of a lot of work to put this together, not to mention it takes a lot of manpower and money. And you know what? We're supposed to be fighting a war here. And I think they just quickly gave up the yearbook idea. But we're fortunate enough to actually have three of the yearbooks. So one's displayed in that case. And uh, let's see. Right after the war was over, they had an open house out there in August of 1945. And they had a... Um, a program, I guess, a magazine, a black and white magazine. They pass out there for all the visitors. And we've had a reprint of it, a stack of reprints of it for years and years and years. And here, I don't know, about a year ago, a guy walks in and he says, do you have one of those uh, books? And we said, oh yeah, we have a stack of reprints over here. We sell them for $5 a piece. He reaches in his little bag and he says, here's an original for you. I was there. I have two. So he gave us one. So we have one original now. We're about out of them. Mike, in fact, is looking into getting some more of the reprints reprinted. We have a lot of models that people gave us. Um, we were to the point now that we actually usually refuse models because we have more than we know what to do with. They, they have to be pretty exceptional for us to accept them now. We do have a model of a big bomber. It's an anachronism. It's a B-36 hybrid bomber. It had both jet engines and uh, piston uh, engines with propellers, but it was, it flew in the 1950s but it was built by a guy here in town named Van Morrow, and uh, he was terminally ill, and he donated it to us. He wanted it preserved, and so we have that now. We think it's a pretty neat item, but not quite the right era. We have a fire truck, and there's Mike in the back. Um, we drive it in parades and in other activities. This happened to be the bicentennial torch. Mike was one of the torch bearers for part of the route. And so we used the fire truck to move Mike through the route. And so that's it. That's the original fire truck that was here in 1942. Not one like it or similar. It's the truck by name, rank, and serial number. And we got it fixed up, painted, redid the interior. The restoration is not perfect, but it's not bad. And, uh, and it runs and it's insured and licensed. And we drive it around. Marty often is our truck driver. He, he's driving it in that picture. We have some other fire memorabilia that went with it. Um, I think this is neat. You used to be able to buy dynamite at the hardware store. You want to blow stumps up out at your farm, whatever you want to do. You went to the hardware store and said, Yo, Sam, give me a box of that dynamite. You know, you can't do that anymore. But we have one of the original dynamite boxes. We have a link trainer. Link trainers were the flight simulator of the day. Cadets spent a lot of time in the link trainer because they didn't have to fly the real airplanes. It didn't cost as much. They all hated it. But anyway, we have one of them. And that, that's the instructor station. The instructor considered the desk and had controls and could make that link trainer do all sorts of bad things. Cadets got sick in them. They, they moved. Um, I don't know if any of you know Tim O'Connor. We didn't have real wings for our link trainer. They were slabs of plywood. And, and Tim thought that was really offensive. And I had some pictures of some real wings that I took out in Seattle. And from those pictures, he built us a set of wings for that. And just from pictures, and these things are a work of art. So one of them we just covered with mylar so you could see it. We have a kid's flight simulator. Kids love that thing, even though it it doesn't do very much mechanically. They have kids have neat imaginations. Boy, you, we can't get them out of it. 
Uh, oh, and that's another Marty project. That thing wasn't really safe. It had a ladder. You climbed up over the back and lowered yourself down into it. There was no door, no steps, no handrail, sharp edges, all the things that, you know, that somebody get hurt on and you draw a huge lawsuit. So Marty had built, maybe he finished building the base for the machine gun display and didn't have anything to do. And I said, Marty, why don't you make that thing safe? I'm envisioning a door, some steps, and a handrail. Get rid of those sharp edges. Three weeks later, it looked like that. So Marty can do stuff. We have the original switchboard that was out there. It was later at the hospital, but we have it back. We have one of the original drafting tables that they used when they designed the base. We have smart work, toolboxes. David Gray is one of the guy is the guy who was had permission to dig most recently from 2008 to 2013. He's an interesting guy. He's a uh, fighter pilot for the Air Force. He's flown for the airlines. He now flies a multi-million dollar jet for uh, a big company out west. And he's also an accomplished artist. And he has given us prints of some of his paintings to sell to raise money for the museum. They're in the $100 range, though, so people don't line up to buy them. But we sell one occasionally. We have some engines. Um, let's see. The drones have been in the news lately, right? They use drones to do drone strikes. Uh, in the Middle East. We had drones in World War II, and this is the engine off one. Uh, we like kind of like that thing. It's pretty unique. We have a lot of propeller blades. Propeller blades that um, from these captured enemy airplanes. And I brought one propeller blade over with me so you can look at that. We have some airplane parts. That's the, the most we have of are of a Fock Wolf FW-190, not the one that crashed out there. But we have other parts. Uh, we have a radiator for this airplane. If you look at the propel white propeller spinner underneath, it looks like a big open mouth. And then if you look inside the mouth, you can see that there's another smaller opening. That's the radiator. That thing was water cooled. There's the radiator. There's a story behind that. There's only one Hawker Typhoon left in the world belongs to the Royal Air Force. It's on loan to the Canadian Air and Space Museum. The Canadian Air and Space Museum curator is all excited about getting this one-of-a-kind airplane for his museum. And But you know what? That airplane doesn't have a radiator in it. He sees that picture on the internet. David Gray posted it on his Facebook page. He goes, nuts, there's a real radiator. So now we start getting together. He contacts David. David calls me. We start examining things. The radiator that we have in our museum is the radiator by serial number that belongs in the only remaining Hawker Typhoon in the world. And we are going to give it to him. We're going to trade them for something. That was dug up too out there. Yeah, and it was dug up out here. Why? Well, and uh, so that begs the question: How the heck did a Hawker Typhoon radiator get here? We had captured enemy airplanes. Ah, oh, but wait, we also had some Allied aircraft here for comparison. And somehow, when they shipped the Hawker back to England after they closed the base, the radiator must have been out of it for maintenance or something, and they. The people they told to get rid of the junk didn't connect the dots, and they threw the radiator out and sent the airplane back to England. Oh, we have engine parts. We have parts of a German. That's a German jet engine that went in the ME-262, the only operational jet fighter in World War II. National Air and Space Museum is supposed to be giving us a whole engine. That's only about a third of the engine. but. We're not holding our breath because they can't get their act together to get them unearthed. This stuff is packed in warehouses in Silver Hill, Maryland. Um, that's a whole experimental German jet engine in a different museum 
there's our version of it. We had one in Seymour, but it got buried. And we unearthed the parts uh, over time. And finally figured out what the parts were and kind of got them stacked up in the right order. But if it, if it wasn't all rusty, it would look like that. Um, that's just an overall shot of a b bunch of pictures we have. The big swastika flag, if you know Al Cyber, he captured that flag personally. So I can tell you that's an authentic flag. He took that in Castro, Germany. He took it down when they took the town. It was during the Battle of the Bulge. Yes, during the Battle of the Bulge. Okay. Um, and we have, over the last couple of years, we have built up a maintenance area. It used to be like we had a pair of pliers and a screwdriver and we couldn't get much done. But over time, we have acquired some power tools, a lot of hand tools, workbenches, and now we can actually work on things. And the item in the foreground is a cabinet that Marty's fixing up and he's got glue and clamps on it. That's what that is. But just the point is we can do some work now. There's an antique drill press we got and restored, and you know what? It's from World War II, and it drills holes. Okay, and so actually, that's the end of the presentation right there. So, I want to thank you for attending. I want to leave you with a thought, though, before you go out the door. We're about to come up on election day here, right? And if you have, if you want to honor veterans, you need to go to the polls and vote next Tuesday. I don't care who you vote for, that's not the point. But these people fought so we could have to continue to have the right to vote and run our own country. And we all need to go out and vote for somebody. And even if you don't like either of the presidential candidates, and I know there are a lot of people that don't, you need to vote for the one you like the least. Because you know what? One of those two people is going to be president. And they're going to get to appoint three or four Supreme Court judge, justices, and that's going to shape how this country runs for the next generation, not just the next four years. So you need to go and vote. And with that, I'll say thank you for coming, and I'll entertain any questions. Yes, sir. Uh, that what you got, uh, that stuff you dug up there sort of tied in with uh, during a time that they were having all these reunions and stuff, that uh, Lou Osherman uh, got a bunch of photographs from the base photographer, and we enlarged them. I was proud of the historical side. We enlarged them and put them on a four bay panel. I suppose you have those uh, still out there. Those are the, the photographs that were taken by Paul Ware, the Ware photo collection? I don't know, but Lou Osherman got them from the base photographer, whoever it was. And, uh, I took them and spent my money on them to enlarge them and put them on the, the, the four bay board and we had them at the historical site and we donated them to the museum. It's and still then, there. It's in the, uh, the back room of the main building. You know, I showed the picture from uh, Vespers Road. It's that group of pictures. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, yeah, we have. Then tying in with your uh, stuff that was buried, uh, we had that on this way up here at the old Gilly garage. Uh, during the Oktoberfest one year for something special, I don't remember what it was, at the historical site they had that display up there. And we had people in, uh, uh, and uh, the base, or the uh, master sergeant, that was uh, the last one here, along with the officer in charge of disposing the stuff, told about how they had a great big auction there, and uh, people coming out of Chicago, they had rolls of material and stuff like that, and they auctioned it all off. When they got through, they only had a few piles of junk that they couldn't sell, and uh, that was probably what you found, and it's what those piles of junk, because he told that story to me personally about the, what they had left over from the base there. And, uh, hey, they auctioned off the beds, the, yeah. the um, stoves, the desks. They auctioned off well, everything. He, he mentioned, like, maybe spark plugs and stuff like that was in these piles of stuff they couldn't sell. They also sold some of the buildings. And one of the things that we had out there was pictures of two of the churches, the chapels that were on the base. And both of those chapels are being used today. One was out on Comiskey Pike, and then the other one's here in town on Laurel Street, I think.
And along with that, a few years ago, the uh, field organ was out there. Uh, who was the preacher that, that they had that was uh, formed the Redeemer Lutheran Church and took the organ there? And they, the church was having an auction, they would auction off. And I went up there and, and to bid on it for the historical society, and another lady. Uh, the long the congregation never bit it off, so I told her that uh, if she ever wanted to get rid of it, we'd like to have the historical side. So she donated the uh, field organ to the historical side uh, down there. And it was used as the organ for the chapel out there. Right, and you can see that organ out at the historical society building in Brownstown. Any day you want to go and see it. I still think it ought to be in our museum, but I don't have to. Who else has a question, please? Please. Helicopters out there, was it, am I thinking wrong that there was a helicopter? There were helicopters out there very briefly. They had them there, it was toward the end of the war. Um, it was the first helicopter training base. Helicopters weren't in wide use in World War II, right? That was a Korean War thing. But at any rate, they were only there a couple months and for unknown reasons they decided to send them over to the base at Rantoul, Illinois. So we do have some helicopter memorabilia there. I said I didn't show slides of everything that we have, uh, but we do have an area where there's some helicopter things. Please. Are there any pictures of uh, what it was like before they started building the facility? Well, not really, but just look anywhere else but there. It was all farmland. And, and it actually was, I'm told, somewhat rolling hills. It wasn't dead flat. But when the army came in, they just pushed the high spots into the low spots while they were knocking down the houses and the barns, and they made it dead flat. That's why it's that flat out there today. Uh, there was a lot of that information in the book that the Blue Ultraman published of Freeman Field, the history of Freeman Field, and it also tells about the uh, Elliott Family Cemetery that I uh, think is under one of the runways up there now that was there at that field. And they, they uh, took the people that were buried there, or their remains or whatever it was, the stones anyhow, and they wouldn't let them bury them out here in the Quaker Cemetery because they said they had to bury them in the same road in order. And uh, so uh, they ended up taking them up to the uh, Sand Creek uh, Cemetery up there at the, across from the Hilltop Trailer Park up at Azalea and put them in the northeast corner up there. And so that Elliott Family Cemetery, the stones at least were moved up there in the northeast corner. So that, so, uh, okay, thanks. Who else? Yeah. I love your bomb story. If you could tell it. Do you remember the bomb story? Where they called in all the reinforcements and Oh, you mean when we when we the, the Japanese mortar round story? Yeah, that was a good one. I don't know how much time do I have? We've been at That's it's it's seven thirty. I think I, I think I'm allowed to be here till eight, is that true? Huh? You're okay. Right. Very close, isn't okay, it? anyway, the mortar round story is that we had a mortar round out there, and we didn't have it in any fixed display. We kept moving it around. And it had ended up on this old picnic table we had in the annex building. It was just laying there. And this guy from St. Louis, who is a naval weapons expert, he has a naval weapons museum that he runs in St. Louis. He calls me up, says he's going to be in town. Would I take him through our museum? I go, sure, I'll meet you out there. So I take him through. And we get down into the annex, and he walks over, and he picks this mortar around up. And he says, where'd you get this? I said, I have no idea. It's been laying around here ever since I've been with the museum. This is about three years ago. Uh, I said, we moved it all over. We don't know what to do with it. We don't have any related items. It's just here. He says, are you in love with that? I said, no, why? He said, I'm at the 90% level that it's live. I said, oh? He said, I said, how do you know? 
He said, when you defuse them, you unscrew the nose off and pour out the gunpowder or explosive. He says, and whenever you do that, the noses are brass, and they always have marks on them from the wrench or the pliers that people grab onto them. He said, this doesn't have any marks. I don't think it's ever been unscrewed. He says, well, you know, the naval crane naval weapons guys ought to look at this. And he whips out a cell phone, calls him up. He knows somebody there because he gets stuff for his museum from them, and, and he's a Navy veteran. So he um, he leaves word, he said, and, and he gives him my telephone number and name. So I go home. Later that, uh, I guess it was, oh, the guy calls me up then from Crate Naval Weapons in the afternoon. He says, hey, here you have this mortar around. I said, yes, yeah. can you send me some pictures? I said, sure. So I took my digital camera, took some pictures, laid a yardstick down by it, and uh, I sent him the pictures. I don't think any of that. I'm having coffee the next morning at home. I'm sitting there in my pajamas in bathroom. Phone rings, about quarter of eight. And it's Mike from Crane Naval Weapons. I said, yeah, good morning, Mike. How can I help you? He said, we want to come up and see that mortar round. Oh, yeah? Well, when would you like to do that? I think he's going to make an appointment for next week. The answer is, we're on our way. We'll be there at 10. <laughs> so they show up, three guys, in one of these big um, GMC, like the giant GMC station wagons that people tow motorhomes with. What are those models called? Benali or something. Benali or something. Yeah. Anyway, big vehicle. And they start carrying stuff in the museum. They look at it, and they said, we got to examine this. They have a little portable x-ray machine. They have three computers. They have measuring devices. They have books. They pour over this thing for about an hour. They say, you know, we're not, we can't say 100% certainty, but we're at the 95% level that's live. So I say, well, okay, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to take it back down to Crane Naval and dispose of it? And his answer was, hell no, I'm not putting that thing in my vehicle. It's not stable. <laughs> he says, let's blow it up here. I blow it up here? Yeah, here. He said, you got big airfield. He says, I said, I don't think we can do it out here. He said, well, the police must know of uh, some place where you can blow stuff up. Call him. Well, I know Chief Abbott, so I call him up. He goes, he wasn't there, but some lieutenant I didn't know said, well, we don't have any place, but you're out the airfield, right? We said, yeah, I'm at the airfield. He said, well, go see Don Furlow, who's the current airport manager, and ask him. So the four of us troop down to Don's office, and we march in there. He looks up and says, this has got to be trouble. I say, hi, these guys are from Crane Naval Weapons. We have a, they say we have a, a live mortar round, and we want to blow it up out here. He says, blow it up out here. Are you crazy? Call the police. <laughs> so we burst out laughing. He says, why are you laughing? I said, Don, they told us to call you. He goes, oh. So anyway, he finally gave us permission to take it across the airfield. And they, these guys open their truck. They have blocks of plastic explosive. So they get a couple of hunks of plastic explosive, which is flexible, and they just kind of wrap it around this mortar round, and they get a roll of duct tape, wrap that around it, get out detonators, stick detonator pins in it, run out all this cord, and we go around behind this big pile of mulch. They have mulch out at the airport that the city collects from blown down trees. And the guy hands me the detonator and says, blow it up. <laughs> so I go, and it goes, kaboom. And the mulch flies all over the place. And that was it. We never saw a scrap of it. So that's the whole story. But for about two hours on a rainy Tuesday morning, we had some excitement. <laughs> OK. Um, I can tell you the German machine gun story, this machine gun. We have two others. So the. There's a TV show on the National Geographic Channel called Diggers. And it's these two guys who are the stars of the show. They run around with a production company and go to places where excavations are in progress. You know, um, 
Civil War stuff, Revolutionary War, they, they, whatever places are buried, they hunt stuff. And then they do this docudrama that's on this digger show. So they get wind that we dig stuff up at Seymour and they call us up. So we go, sure, we'd love to have you come out to the museum and you can dig and we get them in touch with David Gray, who's got permission to dig in that time frame. And so they hire an, an excavator operator guy to come in and David knows some places to dig where you can find stuff. So they're digging. And they start finding bits and pieces of stuff, and they found this machine gun. And so it was the central theme of the show that aired in March of, they were in November 2013, March of 2014. So it's the central theme, and these two guys are holding this machine gun, telling about how they found it. You know, it was good TV, but you know who found the machine gun? David Gray's 16-year-old daughter. Those guys didn't have a darn thing to do with finding that machine gun. She found it and said it was a machine gun when it came out of the ground. And a bunch of other people said, no, that's part of the landing gear for an airplane. And a 16-year-old girl says, no, it's a machine gun. And she was right. And, but the, the two stars latched onto it. And in the TV show, they found it. Don't believe everything you see on Nat Geo TV. That's it. Anybody else? I just not as exciting as all those, but I just wanted to add that you said you know Colonel Price or Price was from here. Uh, he went to high school here, and when he was in high school, the kids built houses back then. And he designed a house that, that they actually built, and I think it's on South Walnut Street. I've got a clipping about it, but I thought you might want to know that if you didn't. Yeah, I'd like to know some detail of that, Charlotte. Yeah, I can email it to you. Yeah. Now, his father lived in the corner of Walnut and McDonald's, southeast corner. It's a two-story yellow house. And, that would and he taught at Manhattan School. Uh, his sister was still in the corner. Yeah, she's around. Yeah, there's, there were several. Mm -hmm. I think that te teasers. Uh, I think she was a Price and. Yeah, she's she's a Yeah. Yeah, please. What was that date you were looking for? I believe it was 1947. Uh, what was it you were looking for that happened in there? Or, uh, you want to establish a date? I, I was after the date the museum actually opened which was sometime in the summer of 1997, I think, but I don't know. 97, yeah. 97, right. Okay, uh, has anybody uh, went through Bowley's book? He had a lot of records in there. If there's any record at all, of it, it's probably in there. You know, the one volume is uh, just a, uh, maybe a sentence or a paragraph about something, and you, you look to find the date, it's not indexed. So you have to look that way, and then you go to the other volume, and you may find a paragraph or a whole page or so about the same subject. If anybody's researched that yet for that, uh, I think Bully's book came out well before we opened the museum. 1976, yeah, I guess it was. Yeah, 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 so it was out. It wouldn't be in there. No, it would not be. Okay. I've got book editions. The air people came in so fast, there wasn't any place for them to live. So they lived in any place they could find. And uh, my parents had people in, in the basement. I was not around. I was born in 45. And they rented out places. Yeah, I did a uh, Kevin Green uh, sponsors uh, historic walking tours a couple times a year, and I've been on a number of them. I really enjoy them. And I went on one this year, and he was talking about that, about how when uh, when the city expanded really, really fast, there were people just living wherever they could find a space. Now, they also had, you, you had some uh, uh, baseball. They also had a place from the swim in the river. Do you have a picture of that or not? The, it was between 6th Street and New Fort Road, about halfway. <coughs> if you ever walked there, it was a great big uh, 
uh, sand thing. And my uncle and my father got that from Ralph Thompson, moved it back and put, it was all screened in at the original. And they put a thing around it, and we had that for well, several years, cabin out there. And what we do have is a picture of the troops on Bessett Road yeah. going to the river. Yeah. yeah, and you can see the picture of when you go on Martin's house, which is the old Abel Farm house. And it's the only house that's on the Bessett Road at that time. Right. And they went out there to bedwalk too, then they out there. Yeah. Yeah, I think the gentleman in the back was going to ask a question a minute ago. Were you? Is going there to... any relationship between Freeman Field and, and Backler? Between Freeman Field and what? Backler and Columbus. Oh, Bacaller, uh, up, up at Columbus. Yeah. Any relationship? Bacaller was a true Air Force base, right? It was after the Army Air Corps became the United States Air Force in 1947. The collar was open into the 70s, right? Yeah, but, but they did open in World War II as well. Were they? Uh, I, thought, I thought it was. But I don't. The airport at Columbus, what's now the Columbus Municipal Airport, was not part of this group of training airports that were involved in this multi engine training. The center of that was Freeman Field, that was home base. Uh, I, I guess the real answer is, I don't know. But I've not heard of any specific relationship. Sir? Uh, I've been up to the museum up there. They said they use that a lot for uh, glider training area, along with certain uh, Port Atterbury. Yeah, they have, a, they have a nifty glider mock-up up there. Uh, the, we now have, our museums have a relationship. I was up there just a few days ago talking to some of the guys. And, um, but as far as what the relationship was of the military bases back in the day, I don't know. They supported Camp Atterbury? Yeah. They what? Supported Camp Atterbury? Okay. Anybody else? Two things. One, uh, that Jim West's website is still out there that is about Freeman Field and Atterbury and McCollum. Yeah, what, what Charles talking about is there's a guy named Jim West who has a website. It is Indiana Military, all, all one word run together, indianamilitary.org. And he has information on his website about all of the military bases in Indiana. And because of our museum, and we have a really good relationship with uh, Jim West, especially Ted Jordan did. And the end result is that IndianaMilitary.org has a ton of stuff about Freeman Field on their website. And incidentally, I didn't mention it, but we, our museum, has a new website now. We have our own, finally, after all these years, Freeman Army Airfield Museum.org. And uh, there, there's some interactive stuff on it. There's an event calendar. We try, we work at keeping it up to date. The virtual tour is on there. Also, there's one of these 360 degree things where it just pans the whole museum and you can control it. It's pretty neat. Okay, okay. one other thing. Uh, upstairs in the library, uh, you can now search not only the local newspapers for free, but, well, all over the country and all over the world for that matter. So one of the things you can do is find stuff on Freeman Field or when the museum was started and that kind of thing. I mean, it's easier than looking through page by page and sometimes you find stuff. Newspapers.com, isn't it? Well, one of them is newspapers.com and the other one is newspaper archive. And I pay a couple hundred dollars a year to have access at home. And so it's, I really think it's a worthwhile thing. It's free up here. That's right. OK, thank you. OK, if nobody has anything else, then that's it. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Yeah. <laughs>